Happy New Year, Mr. Secretary. Hello, Matt. And in honor of the new year, I have exactly 2,020 questions to ask, <laughs> ask you, but uh, I'll pare them down for the sake of brevity. Thank you, sir. One is there continue to be um, questions about the nature of the intelligence that led to the strike on, that killed uh, uh, General Suleiman. Uh, can you be at all more specific about you know how imminent this was, what exactly it was? Secondly, why not allow Foreign Minister Zarif to come to the UN to speak at the uh, Security Council? And then lastly, did the, did the situation in Iran have anything contribute at all to your decision not to run for the Senate from Kansas? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, last one's easy. Uh, uh, I said the same thing yesterday that I said for months. <laughs> No, no real news there. I said that I'm going to stay serving as Secretary of State so long as President Trump uh, shall have me. Uh, so, uh, no, I, if I, you can accuse me of being inconsistent elsewise, but not on that one. Uh, second, uh, uh, you know, we don't comment on visa matters, those traveling here to the United States on visa, so I can't add much more to this issue of uh, Foreign Minister Zarif's travel to the United States. I'll say only this. Uh, we will always comply with our obligations under the uh, UN requirements and the headquarters agreement, and we will do so in this particular instance and, and more broadly uh, every day. Uh, and finally, you know, there, there's been much made about this question of intelligence and imminence. I, I answered it multiple times on Sunday. I, I'm happy to, to walk through it again. Anytime a president makes a decision of this magnitude, there are multiple pieces of information that come before us. We presented that to him in all its broad detail. We gave him all the best information that came not only from the intelligence community, but for those of us who have uh, teams in the field. We evaluated the relevant risks and uh, the opportunity that we thought right. might present itself at some point. Uh, and we could see clearly that uh, not only had Soleimani done all of the things that we have recounted, right, hundreds of thousands, a massacre in Syria, uh, enormous destruction of countries like Lebanon and Iraq, where they've denied them sovereignty, and the, the Iranians have really denied the people in those two countries what it is they want, right? Sovereignty, independence, and freedom. These are, this is all Soleimani's handiwork. Uh, and then we'd watch as he was continuing the terror campaign in the region. Uh, we know what happened uh, at the end of last year in December, ultimately leading to the all death right. of an American. So if you're looking for imminence, you need to look no further than the days that led up to the strike that was taken against Soleimani. And then you, in addition to that, have what we could clearly see were continuing efforts on behalf of this terrorist to build out a network of campaign activities that were going to lead potentially to the death of many more Americans. It's the right decision. We got it right. The Department of Defense did excellent work. Uh, and the president had a uh, entirely legal, appropriate, and a basis as well as a decision that fit perfectly within our strategy and how to counter the threat of malign activity from Iran more broadly. Kira? Hey, Mr. Secretary. Yes, ma'am. Um, two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, Iran's Foreign Affairs Minister Zarif uh, granted an interview saying that Soleimani was on a diplomatic uh, visit to Iraq, uh, that the U.S. strike to take him out uh, was state terrorism, that President Trump has prepared to commit war crimes, and that Iranians are enraged. First, that's the first question. I'd like your reaction to that. Second question. President Trump has indicated that Iran's cultural sites could be targeted. Is that true? Are they on the target list? And if so, do you consider that a war crime? So, let's see. So, uh, Zarif's statement. Uh, uh, his first statement that is Soleimani was traveling to Baghdad on a diplomatic mission. Anybody here believe that? Is there any history that would indicate that it was remotely possible that this kind gentleman, this diplomat of great order, Qasem Soleimani, had traveled to Baghdad for the idea of conducting a peace mission? I, I, I made you reporters laugh this morning. That's fantastic. Uh, we know that wasn't true. We not only know the history, uh, we know in that moment that was not true. Zarif is a propagandist of the First Order, uh, and most of what you suggested in his uh, text message or email or message that you laid out there uh, was indeed uh, Iranian propaganda. It's not new. We've heard these same lies before. Uh, it's fundamentally false. He was not there on a diplomatic vision trying to resolve a problem. I know there's been some story that he was there uh, representing a Saudi peace deal. I I've spoken to my Saudi counterparts at great length. I'll leave to them what the contents of their messages may be, but I can assure you uh, that they will share my view that he was not there representing uh, some kind of agreement that was going to reduce risk or reduce the risk to the lives of Americans when he was on that trip. 
Uh, your last piece was about uh, cultural sites. I said on Sunday, I will reiterate it again. Uh, every target that's being reviewed, every uh, effort that's being made will always be conducted inside the International Law Support. I've seen it. I've, I've worked on these, uh, this project, uh, and I'm very confident of that. David Brinson? Uh, thank you. Um, this is yes, sir. Um, uh, it, it's an election year, and uh, you're now facing two nuclear-related crises um, in uh, with, with, with Iran and uh, North Korea. Are you, are you optimistic about uh, resolving either of those without them sort of blowing up, at, so to speak, at uh, inopportune moments? And on the Iran front, Iran's breakout time when you came into office was considered to be about a year. Is it now longer or shorter? I'll leave to the intelligence team to talk to you about the details of uh, Iran's breakout time for the moment. Uh, but President Trump could not be more clear. Uh, on our watch, Iran will not get a nuclear weapon. And as we came into office, Iran was on a pathway uh, that had been provided by the nuclear deal, which clearly gave them the opportunity to have those nuclear weapons. We won't let that happen. Uh, as for the first question, which was more broadly, what President Trump laid out in his national security strategy with respect to both North Korea and Iran is the plan that we have executed, the strategy that we have executed for this uh, past three years. Uh, we have put Iran in a place that it has never been before, uh, where they've had to make some very difficult choices, choices about how to uh, pay for and underwrite their proxy militias around the region, uh, whether and how to build out their missile program. This is a flip from where we were eight years before. It's not political. The previous administration made a different choice. They chose to underwrite and appease. We have chosen to confront and contain. Uh, those, are, those are different strategies. Uh, we believe ours is successful. And we ultimately believe it will be successful at making Iran behave like a normal nation. We'll deny them the capacity to build out their nuclear program and threaten not only Americans and our lives to keep Americans safe, which is our mission set, uh, but also to create enhanced stability throughout the Middle East. We're confident that that's the case. Uh, North Korea, which you asked about, uh, we, we still are hopeful. Uh, that we will be able to head down a uh, path. I was here with you all in December sometime when there was lots of talk about what might happen at the end of the year. We've not seen that yet. We still remain uh, engaged and hopeful that we can have a conversation about how to get the denuclearization that Chairman Kim promised to President Trump back in 2018. Mm -hmm. Take one more. Okay, James. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Two quick things here on the Soleimani strike. Since the Trump administration withdrew the United States from the Iran nuclear deal mm -hmm. but about two years ago or so. Um, the Trump administration has said repeatedly that it is pursuing against Iran a maximum pressure campaign. First question, the Soleimani operation, was that part of the maximum pressure campaign? Do you have a second one? Yeah, let's, we'll come back to it. Maybe you just ask them both, then I'll, I'll, I'll tackle them to both. To your yeah. knowledge, was any legal counsel in the executive branch consulted for his or her input uh, surrounding the legal aspects of the strike prior to its, uh, its execution. You know, I'll, I'll leave to others to comment on that, but I can say as a pattern in practice, I have never seen this administration engage in uh, an activity of this nature without a thorough and complete legal review of uh, what the basis would be if the president were to make a series of decisions. Often the lawyers review all of the options that are being presented to the President of the United States in advance of them being presented such that uh, every option that is presentative has been fully vetted through the legal process. I, I'm confident that that was the case here, although I don't have specific knowledge of that. I'm, I'm confident that that was, uh, that was the case. Uh, second, you, you asked about the scope of the, camp, the strategy and the maximum pressure campaign that we've had in place. It has a diplomatic component, it has had an economic component, and it has had a military component. And what you have seen over the course of these past uh, you, May 2018, when we withdrew from the uh, Iran nuclear deal, you've seen us execute that with enormous vigor and energy. You've seen it diplomatically. We've built out coalitions around the region with the Israelis, with the Gulf states, uh, on certain files, on the missile file and on the terror file with our European partners as well, not just the E3. Go back and look from May of last year. Go look at the statement that was made in Warsaw, a United statement centering the instability in the Middle East on the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, we've got a coalition now uh, in the Straits of Hormuz who diplomatically isolated the Iranian regime. Uh, second, economically, we've all seen the sanctions put in place. It's now over some thousand sanctions. We've watched 
the regime struggled to figure out uh, how it was they were going to make it through 2020. Uh, they've got a budget that will fall short by a significant amount in 2020 as a direct result of the pressure that we've put on the regime. And then you saw over not just this past week, but over the last year, you've seen our uh, security component to this. You've seen us reinforce allies in the region by ensuring that the Emirates and the Saudis and all of the others were prepared for what might happen if Iran decided to make choices that were bad for the Iranian people. And then you saw more tactically, just these last few days, uh, the president's response when uh, the Iranians made a bad decision to kill an American. We hope, we hope they won't make another bad decision just like that one. Clear. Uh, the Soleimani strike was part of the administration's maximum pressure campaign, and going forward, the Iranians should understand as they develop their calculus that similar actions, such as the Soleimani strike, could well continue to be a feature of this maximum pressure campaign. I think the president's been unambiguous in his, about the remarks he made down in Florida, as well as the tweets that he's put out about the seriousness with which we take this, uh, the risk attendant that we are deeply aware of, uh, and the preparations we've made to prevent those risks, as well as our determination that in the event the Iranians make another bad choice, that uh, president will respond in a way that he did last week, which was decisive, serious, uh, and messaged Iran about the constraints that we are going to place on that regime so that it doesn't continue to put American lives at risk. At the end, our Iran policy is about protecting and defending the homeland and securing American lives. I know that the efforts that we have taken, not only last week with the strike against Soleimani, but the strategy that we have employed has saved American lives. I'm highly confident in that. Thank you. Take one more. Take one more. Yeah. Andrea, yes, ma'am. How are you? Thank you very much. Uh, a question about the issue of cultural sites, because the president said on Air Force One coming back, after you had been on the Sunday talk shows, that they're allowed to kill our people, they're allowed to torture and maim our people, they're allowed to use roadside bombs and blow up our people, and we're not allowed to touch their cultural sites. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Defense Secretary Esper has made it clear that he would not follow an order to hit a cultural site would, would be a war crime. I'm wondering what whether you would also push back in your advice or in your in your role. Uh, You're not really wondering, this. Andrea. <laughs> You're not really wondering. I was, I was unambiguous on Sunday. It is completely consistent with what the president has said. No, uh, we, will, we, will take, we will take every action we take will be consistent with the international rule of law and uh, you, you, the American people so can rest assured that that's the case. Without, Let me tell you who's done damage to the Persian culture. It's not the United States of America. It's the Ayatollah. Amen. If, if you want to look at who Amen. has denied uh, religious freedom, if you want to know who has denied the Persian culture is rich and steeped in history and intellect, and they've denied the capacity for that culture to continue, if you go back and look at the holidays around Cyrus and Nerus, they've not permitted people uh, to celebrate. They've not allowed people that they've killed, that Qasem Soleimani killed. Right. They've not allowed them to go mourn their family members. The real risk to Persian culture does not come from the United States of America. Sure. That there is no, there is no mistake about that. No mistake. Good day. You have been watching Secretary of State Mike Pompeo taking questions from reporters, including our own chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, there at the State Department. A uh, couple of headlines from the secretary. And on that final question from Andrea, let's be clear here. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is saying something different than what President Trump has suggested. The secretary uh, insists that the U.S. will not conduct any action that operates outside the bounds of international laws. Striking a cultural site, as the president has suggested he wants to do, would in fact violate those international laws. Uh, and so there is a discrepancy there between what President Trump has said just on Sunday, seeming to double down on that, and what we are hearing from Secretary Pompeo. He also talked about the imminence of the threat from General Qasem Soleimani, who was killed in that U.S. airstrike last week. But just like National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien declined to offer actual evidence or proof of what that threat actually was. I want to go down to our team in the field, frankly, here in Washington and around the world. Peter Alexander back at the White House. Our Tehran Bureau Chief, Ali Arouzi in Iran. Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel in Northern Iraq. NBC's Courtney Cuby is here in our Washington Bureau covering the Pentagon. Also joining us, former Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration, William Cohen. Secretary Cohen, I'll get to you in a moment. But Richard, I want to start with you and with Ali Arouzi out in the region. And how you think officials overseas have heard what Secretary Pompeo had to say here. Richard, to you. 
So what we're seeing now is the Secretary of State owning this hardline policy. Uh, this is an administration that has pushed out the former National Security Advisor, John Bolton, and uh, now we see Pompeo coming out and saying, this is our policy, we're not apologizing for it, left open the door that there might be other kinds of strikes against Iranian officials as part of this maximum pressure campaign, and being completely unapologetic, saying the policy of the United States is to put as much possible economic physical and potentially military pressure on Iran to get Iran to capitulate. He talked about Iran's reach, how it has a reach even into Afghanistan, and says the U.S. is watching that as well. So he was putting Iran on, on notice and saying the strike against Soleimani is just part of a broader campaign that he, the Secretary of State, fully endorses. He himself is coming out and saying, it's my policy, I'm the spokesman for it, and a policy that he says will continue. Continue. And you know, Ali Ruzi, that that is being heard loud and clear in Tehran, even as overnight we saw that deadly stampede at the funeral for Qasem Soleimani. Now his burial is on hold and new threats now coming out from Iran about retaliation against the U.S. That's right, Hallie. Quickly about uh, Qasem Soleimani's funeral this morning. Uh, the motions were running high. It was in his hometown. Uh, enormous amounts of crowds gathered, and a stampede broke out. State TV is now saying over 50 people were killed in that stampede, including children. Wow. Uh, and now to this, uh, this rhetoric that's, that's being uh, exchanged between Washington and Tehran. I mean, there does, doesn't seem to be any appetite to de-escalate on either side. Uh, Tehran is ramping up its, its rhetoric almost Animals. on an hourly basis. Animals. This morning, uh, Iran's parliament just designated an extra 200 million euros to the Buds Force, that's the international arm of the IRGC, to, for their operations over just the next uh, two months. Parliament designated the Pentagon and the U.S. Army as terrorist organizations, which would give them, at least within Iran and amongst their allies, a reason to strike back. They'd also designated ISIS as a terrorist organization here. And uh, the, the current head of the IRGC was giving a speech at Qasem Soleimani funeral before that stampede broke out and he, he said let me make this very clear this is my first and final word that we are going to seek revenge on the United States have no doubt about that and if they react to our attack we'll burn down any place that's dear to the United States so this is an extremely worrying cycle of escalation between the two of them and the general feeling here is not uh, if Iran is going to strike the United States states, but when and how. Uh, they have a mm. whole host of options available to them. We've spoken about cyber. Uh, they have their proxies that are scattered across this entire region that are close to U.S. assets. Um, and they could even take the option of striking directly using the IRGC. So there is no mistake where that retribution came from. So uh, it's, it's a very tense situation here. And I can tell you, many people in Iran, even though they do seek uh, retribution, they expect Iran to strike back. They're also very anxious here. They're worrying what Iran's next move is going to be, what the United States' next move is going to be, and what that means for the people that live in this country. Ali? Secretary Cohen is with us here on set. Secretary, world leaders have called for a de-escalation of this. What you heard from Secretary Pompeo in the last 20 minutes or so did not seem to move the ball closer to that. Right. It seemed to send the signal that um, if you uh, respond to what we've just done, we will hit you even harder, targeting other high-level individuals. Uh, I think uh, it's clear that the Iranians are going to respond. I think they'll calibrate their response so it's not too hard, uh, not too soft, not too hard. So a proportionate response. Response, a proportionate response and then see what the president does. But in the meantime, there's something going on. That is President Putin. Putin is meeting with Chancellor Merkel. He's meeting with uh, President Erdogan. He's meeting with the, uh, uh, the president of uh, France, uh, Macron. 
I think Putin is going to play the peacemaker, ultimately, to make sure this doesn't get out of hand. And as we know, President Trump is accustomed to having leadership exerted by President Putin. He did it in Syria. He's done it in North Korea. I'm uh, assuming that he will try to intervene here because he has a real interest uh, in Iran. Iran is one of their uh, states that they support. He's not going to want to see the United States and Iran getting into an all-out war with the destruction of that country. So I think that Putin is going to play the peacemaker uh, in this uh, whole confrontation. When you talk about the, the retaliation here on both sides of this from Iran and the U.S., Secretary Pompeo echoed, frankly, Defense Secretary Esper, who said yesterday that the U.S. will operate within the bounds of international law. Secretary Pompeo was very clear that the U.S. will conduct any strikes within the bounds of international law. That would seem to preclude the targeting of cultural sites, despite what President Trump now has repeatedly said might potentially be on the table here. How do you read that? as a contradiction to what the president has said. Uh, you may recall that when uh, President Trump said he favored torture, he favored waterboarding, he favored a much tougher uh, position, uh, similar to what the uh, the ISIS and Taliban might do. He said uh, it during the campaign when I covered him back. said it, and then Secretary uh, Mattis said, no, uh, waterboarding is not right, uh, torture is wrong, et cetera. Uh, the president still believes that he's right on this, and that's why I think he intervened in the Gallagher case to say, I don't care what you do on the battlefield, I'm going to back you up, even if it's torture, even if it's something of violence violates the international law pertaining to war. Uh, I'm going to have your back under those circumstances. So I think the president hasn't given up on that. And the real issue is, uh, would he, under these circumstances, go after uh, a monument or something of historical and cultural value? Um, the Iranians, under those cases, that case, might go after something here. Uh, I won't get into the naming of what they might uh, attack, but I think we no ought not to go down that uh, road. It may be just um, the, the, the president being bombast uh, instead of bomb bombastic instead of bombing. I, I think would be the way I'd put it. Uh, I don't think the Secretary of State, given his uh, statement, and uh, Secretary of Defense would stand for taking out cultural sites after their statements have been made. Before I let you go, I want to ask you too about not just Secretary Mike Pompeo now, who has been, frankly, the public face of a lot of the messaging surrounding the Soleimani strike. You saw him out on all the Sunday shows this weekend. He is doing this briefing that we've been watching now for the last 25 minutes or so. You also have at the Defense Department their attempts to try to calm kind of a storm of their own making here, right? And this is a, the official letter to Iraq saying it was repositioning forces to leave the country, an hours-long scramble that really only stopped after a urgent briefing was called, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff telling reporters it was a mistake, mm -hmm. no decision to pull troops from Iraq had been made. What does this say to you about the state of leadership currently in this moment of potential international crisis? Uh, lack of coordination, uh, confusion, uh, dysfunctionality. Uh, number one, uh, the president wants to get out of uh, Iraq. He has pledged to get out of Iraq. Uh, the uh, parliament passed a non-binding resolution saying leave. And now the president saying, we're not leaving. Well, I think what the uh, the commander on the, the field was saying, you know, we're not an occupying force. We are there by virtue of the invitation of the Iraqis. And when they say we don't want you anymore, we have to leave. And the president said, no, we're staying, uh, and you're going to pay for everything that we have done there. That's uh, pretty inconsistent with uh, uh, standard operating procedure. He might end up having to destroy the facilities there before we leave, but you cannot occupy a country mm. under international law. If they say go, we have no choice but to pick up and go if we're going to abide by the law. Secretary William Cohen, uh, it is excellent to have your perspective this morning on what is a very busy news morning. Yes. Let's stay on the Defense Department, head over to the Pentagon where Courtney Kuby is actually posted up here in our bureau, but covering the Pentagon. Courtney, uh, when you talk about one of the things you heard from Secretary Pompeo was this issue of uh, intelligence. He refused, declined to get into it, as we have seen, for example, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien also declined to provide evidence, although O'Brien did go a step further than what we've heard, saying that the imminent threat that the administration has been talking about related to an attack on diplomats, essentially, in facilities. Uh, uh, what else are you hearing? What else do we know? And, and where does this go from here? Yeah, so, and, and you mentioned a little bit about how uh, General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, came out and spoke to reporters twice yesterday in this frantic and, and hectic scene that I, I've never seen anything like it, candidly, at the Pentagon. Uh, one of the things that he did really double down on, though, is the intelligence and his confidence in it. Uh, he said he, he stands 100 percent behind it and it's solid. Uh, he has no question about it. The one thing that I find is so is so interesting whenever, whether it's Secretary Esper or General Milley or even Secretary Pompeo just now talking about this intelligence is whenever they're talking about it, they continue to go back to things that Soleimani has done in his past and, and emphasize that almost as much as they emphasize this concern about some sort of an imminent threat. 
There's no question. The U.S. military officials who I've spoken with say that Qasem Soleimani, he has been a threat. He continued to be a threat. But the reality is, the uh, what they cannot say with, with confidence is that his death mitigates that threat in any serious way. So not just this this imminent threat that they keep talking about there in the region. Which Why can't he say it? He just said it. Why can't he say it? He just said it. That by taking out this guy eliminates a great deal of future attacks. Which we know. I tell you, people, man, people don't, people don't listen good or they just make up stuff in their own minds towards what they think that they heard. Uh, they, they take things out of context. They, they misinterpret uh, what people had just said. Um, some of these news uh, commentators are just awful whenever it comes to hearing what was just said. You don't add to, you don't take from, you don't try to categorize it or glamorize it or put it in other types of, uh, of different categories. It is what it is. You say what you mean, you mean what you say had something to do with potential attacks in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, that may still be the case. That may still be an, an active and, and, con, and continuing threat. But not just that. Soleimani had built this network of armies all throughout the region. Look at that guy's eyes. Look into that man's eyes right there, and you're basically looking into the, into the uh, windows of nothing but pure, mere agony and evil. Whenever you look into this individual's eyes, you're basically looking into the eyes of Lucifer himself, Satan himself, just like Hitler or some of the other tyrants that have went forth. This, this man has caused so much grief and pain over to the Syrians and other surrounding areas it's not even funny, not counting the, the grief that he's caused in the American people's lives. This man is evil. Look at the darkness in his eyes. He's nothing but dark. And he's sitting there gleaming over. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Look at me. I'm the evilest one of all. Yeah. We're going to have to initiate the policies of what they of what they um, implemented back years and years ago. And when I say years and years ago, I'm talking about thousands of years ago to where whenever you go in and emerge upon to a society or a culture, you're going to have to basically take out the whole society because if you don't watch, they pop back up. They start out little, okay? They start out real little. And then the next thing you know, they get a little bigger. The next thing you know, they get a little bigger. And then the next thing you know, they get a little even bigger. You know what I'm saying? They keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. And unless you can t stomp out the, the whole ideology in that culture, it's just going to come back and haunt you again. It's just going to come back and bite you again. That's the reason why that they done what they done back years ago whenever they'd go to war. In the Old Bible, in the Old Testament, they wouldn't just kill one or two of them. They take out the whole culture. Men, women, children, dogs, cats, chickens. They'd, they'd take it all out. Because they did not want nothing to come back and haunt them later on. And that's exactly what's happening to our generation today. Not just here in America, but all over the world. Pertaining to this type of evil, this type of tyranny, this type of terrorism that has basically put a cancer onto the stability of this planet. The stability of this planet. Not, not, not counting the stability of this country, but the stability of this planet. Thank God we got somebody up there that can see through all this and can understand that evil needs to be eradicated. You stomp out evil. You don't allow for evil to, to grow and to tolerate. Because if you give somebody an inch, the next thing you know, they're going to take a mile. And if you give them a mile, the next thing you know, they'll want to take two miles. And then they'll want to take 
10 miles, and then they'll want to take 100 miles. And before long, they have taken you over. They have literally uh, taken you over just as a cancer or some sort of uh, a bad plague. And that's what we're seeing of the developments thereof towards all this wickedness and evil over there in that area. And of course it talks about it in the Bible pertaining to Balaam. And Balak, the Persian Empire, has never died. The old Persian practices and the old Persian uh, ideology has never died. It's still just as live and as well today as what it was a thousand years B.C., before Christ ever come onto the scene. Can you only imagine, can you only imagine Jesus walking around preaching his gospel in a evil demonic society such as that, knowing that it just at any given will, one of these commanders, one of these chiefs, one of these dictators, one of these tyrants, all they'd have to do is give the order and the centurion Romans would have taken Jesus out immediately. And of course there at the last, Jesus knew, he knew that they was gunning for him. He knew that he had done already gotten on their radar screen. And because of it, Jesus was having to be very, very precautious and, and clever and careful whenever he would ease off into a group of people or be seen in a big setting. He would basically have to uh, almost walk around in disguise just to be able to get in and get out. Because there was many, many times that his life was threatened way, way before uh, Palm Sunday. Way before Palm Sunday, Jesus' life was threatened many, and many, and many times. Even whenever he was just a baby, his life was threatened. Evil, the entity of evil is real. And the entity of evil is what has brought all this pain, misery, and sorrow upon to society. Now, evil would love to turn it around and point its finger back at the Heavenly Father and say, you're the one that's caused all this, all this uh, hardship upon to humanity. That's the sly trickery of the devil. That's what the devil's job is to do, is try to deceive people and get, get them to believe uh, in a in a ideology that isn't real or isn't so, isn't true. And he has almost convinced various cultures of that very thing. And he has been working very, very hard right here in America towards brainwashing people in not understanding the difference between good and bad. Just like whenever I was up in Kentucky, you know, praying and fasting, for peace and utopia and a revival, it's very obvious that the federal courts, as well as the state courts, they didn't want to protect my rights. They didn't want to protect that in which what this country originally was founded upon, pertaining to our practices, pertaining to our policies. No, no, no. They seen me as me being a threat. Why? Because the state of Kentucky is protecting Satan, protecting the evildoers, protecting the greed, protecting the, uh, the type of corruption that has now spread all over their state to the point that it's almost bankrupt their very state. The same way that has happened as the state of Illinois and other states in America that are just barely, barely hanging on. They can't even fix their roads. They barely can fix their bridges whenever they're fixing to fall in as far as safety issues. And, and it's obvious that whenever you have to uh, do a thousand dollar repair on your automobile because you're steadily uh, having to run over your automobile with holes and, and cracks in the road and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's very obvious towards 
we are failing in our policies towards maintaining the infrastructure so that we don't have to pay a thousand dollars every year just to be able to put new linkages and front end parts on our automobiles so it don't sound like a rattle trap going down the road or feel like a rattle trap going down the road pertaining to safety issues. This country has been engulfed by this cancer. And now we're seeing an administration that is waking up to this and they are attacking the right entities towards trying to stomp, eradicate, uh, rid the very axes of evil. Thank God somebody has finally woken up up there in the White House to the point of seeing this and identifying the dangers in the not only American people's lives, but in our allies. And to think that Obama was crazy enough to go over there and give them, what was it, th three pallets of $100 bills stacked up almost chest high, over a billion and a half dollars, and give them the green light towards going in and, and having all the nuclear uh, stuff that they wanted? Knowing that this country was that close to Jerusalem over in Israel? Oh my God, thank God that we have an administration that has finally woken up to this type of tyranny. Because it wasn't if it was going to occur, it was a matter of when that it was going to occur. And, and even stomping this guy here out, that ain't no guarantees that it's going to gonna, uh, stop stop it or even slow it down it may actually uh exacerbate the problem towards actually speeding it up temporarily in the in the, on the front end before we finally arise everybody else throughout the country that holds the same values that we do in our policies towards going after this type of corruption going after this type of wickedness these people have brought so much harm and so much sorrow to their own people over there. It's not even funny. It's not even funny. It's sickening. Sickening to the very core. And his death does not change the fact that those armies still... You know, if the truth be known, I'm going to bring this out because they was wanting to act like that they was memorializing this guy towards him being some sort of a uh, a uh, martyr. Once more, their ideology is mixed up. Their mindset is, is crazy. You don't try to memorialize the devil, Satan, in the devil's underhanding achievements and the devil's wickedness towards bringing that type of harm and destruction and misery and sorrow to his own people. You, you applaud towards trying to take something like that out. You don't memorialize his death. That man didn't stand up for the values that Christ stood up for towards turning thy cheek do good to thy uh, neighbors and, and love thy enemies. He, he didn't stand up for none of those values. He was just the opposite. And to think that all them people over there have tried to memorialize his death towards turning him into, into some sort of martyr, it tells you the... It speaks volumes about the mindset of that culture of people over there that don't know the difference between right and wrong. They don't know the difference between good and evil. They don't know the difference between what's considered righteousness versus what's considered unrighteousness. And they have been brainwashed in believing the way that they believe. That's the reason why, as of this morning or last night, whenever it was, they had a large stampede that has killed dozens and dozens of people 
because everybody started moving in the wrong direction at the right time. And the next thing you know, a bunch of people got freaking killed. Probably, if the truth be known, there's probably thousands that's injured because of it. You can't put a group of people together like that and think that you're not going to have some sort of problems, especially whenever you have the mixed crowd of men, women, and children. You got a mixed crowd of not only the stoutest of the stoutest, but the weakest of the weakest. You got people in there that's probably in their 90s that can't hardly get around, much less get around in a crowd in that type of demand. So their whole concept, whenever it comes to safety issues, are completely off the chart. Completely off the chart in how that they construct themselves. And in a way, there's no doubt, in a way, I pity these people. I feel sorry for these people. Because they have been so vulnerable under the hand of the evildoers to the point that now they're basically uh, like uh, sheep being led to slaughter. And they don't realize that they have been bamboozled, that they have been uh, tricked, they have been deceived with their, with their uh, leadership of their policies over there and how that basically they're just uh, barely existing, much less surviving whenever it comes to a thriving society, whenever it comes to them uh, having engineers and doctors and scientists and, and people over there that, that are really favoring in the degree of being good productive citizens to their society, they're basically just got a bunch of deadbeats over there. A bunch of people that wants to just basically lounge around and not hardly do nothing. People sleeping under shade trees. People still getting around on camels. People still wanting to uh, be at one another's throats all the time. It's a very, very sick, toxic environment. Extremely, extremely horrible. One of the most horrible is, I think, on the planet. There may be one other horrible, one other uh, area that's a little bit worse, and uh, that would be over there in that same area where they've got something like two or three million refugees right now. Uh, that's another sad, sad, toxic environment. That's over there in that same area. God, our Heavenly Father, did not intend for His people to be somebody's floor mat or to be somebody's whipping post. God, our Heavenly Father, did not intend for the wicked to keep us under subjection to the point that we was nothing more than slaves to the wickedest of the wicked. That's not what God intended. Whenever it says in the Bible to let the, the wheat grow with the tares, the wheat representing the good, the tares representing the evil, that actually meant on an equal scale, similar towards how our democracy over here in America is supposed to be run. In other words, the true, humble, Christian is supposed to have just as much right of going up and down that road that he's paid his taxes on as the heathen that don't believe in God and rather pray to the devil. The true Christian in America has just as much right of going into a restaurant or going into a theater and enjoying his or herself the same as the atheist or the agnostic. Over there, it's not that way. No, no, no. Over there, they tell you how to live, where to go, what type of enjoyment you're going to have, what type of enjoyment you're not going to have. You're being dominated by a tyranny-type environment that is very, very toxic. And to think that those people are subjected to that type of rule, uh, being held under bondage like that, is just mind-blowing, especially in the 21st century, in the year 20 and 20 that we're in. So thank God for 
the administration that we have in power right now that can recognize these things and can try to stomp out this wickedness and this evil that's going to bring that much more harm and ridicution and pain to not only the Americans but to all the other people who are good people that these people want to dominate and, and bring cruelty, cruelty to the godly, to the righteous had their marching orders and that they are con they will continue to see the United States and allies in the region as a continued threat. And I just have to point to, you know, we had been hearing last week, we reported that the 173rd out of Vincenza had been activated for a potential threat in Lebanon. Well, in fact, they got their deployment orders. A group of them did. They will be moving into Lebanon in the coming days. So th the threat against the U.S. US diplomats there in Beirut continues, Hallie. Courtney Kuby in Washington, Ali Ruzi in Tehran, Richard Engel in Iraq, Peter Alexander at the White House, Secretary Bill Cohen. Thank you all for being with us this morning. I appreciate it. We have a lot more to talk about as it relates to Iran, but we also have Congress back to work today facing dual crises, not just with the international crisis overseas, but with impeachment as well. We're live on Capitol Hill with the latest as one of the president's former key advisors agree to maybe testify. Look at all these people. Just stop and look at all these people. This little square right here, from here to here, maybe a little bit wider, from here to here. There's a hundred people right there. There's a hundred people right here, all squeezed up, shoulder to shoulder. They don't look like it, but they are, because you got children in here that you can't see, little people. Okay, so if you got to take that right there, and then that right there, and then that right there, that right there, what you're looking at right here especially whenever it goes all the way back here because the little squares get, you actually get smaller. The further away you go, the squares get smaller. So what you're actually looking at right here, just right here in this picture right here, give or take 2,000 people, at least. That's being conservative. 2,000 people. You put 2,000 people in an environment shoulder to shoulder, Heel to toe, you are asking for trouble on the level of a stampede. You're asking for all kinds of diseases and all kinds of different types of viruses to be exposed from one individual to another. That's going to just be a cesspool of harm and hurt. To now all the rest of them that didn't have a disease has caught a disease off somebody else that's sneezing, coughing, rubbing up against them. That right there is a very, very toxic, sick environment of having to put that many people together like that under those circumstances. Under those circumstances. And of course, whenever you hear about stampedes, it just goes to show you that they're not doing things in an orderly fashion. You know, whenever you got just as many people that's walking one direction as you do people that's walking in the opposite direction, you got total chaos. It'd be like trying to put a bunch of people out here on the interstate and everybody just do just travel any way you want to go. It'd be just total chaos. God help them. God help those people over there. God help us. God help the people over in Australia that's, that's seeing biblical proportion prophecy coming true as far as devastating their, their land. That's just it's horrifying to watch stuff like that. It's horrifying. 